Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number 35 of the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. My name is Patrick Norris, and our goal today is to help you lead with a whole heart, a healthy brain, and a soul on fire. I'm so glad you're with us. Today, we are in episode number 35 with my friend, Joyce Hill. She has served in multiple Fortune 500 companies as their organizational director. Her career has taken her into the C-suites of Sprint Telecommunications, State Street, H&R Block, and Chrysler Financial. After years in the marketplace, she took her experience and expertise into the classroom as an adjunct university professor. Our conversation today is titled, A Crash Course in Emotional Intelligence and Feedback. This is part one of two. In this part one, in the two-part conversation, we talk through what emotional intelligence is and the powerful difference there is in hard skills and soft skills. We talk about how emotional intelligence is fundamental to success organizationally, in leadership, and in overall life. We talk about where to begin in the developmental journey, how to flush out the blind spots, and how to seek out credible mentors who can give us feedback. We talk about the principles of great feedback, how to receive it and how to offer it to others. You're going to really enjoy this inspiring, insightful and energizing show. Before we jump into it, I want to invite you, your networks and staff into one of our personal discovery experiences. Personal discovery experiences are two hour online events with me, a psychologist, therapist, and with a group of six to 20 peers as we discover the roots that drive individual stories. These training events are designed for those who want to know what drives them and to better equip those that they lead. The next cohort for senior pastors will be September 21st. Our next cohort designed for church ministry staff like executive pastors or youth pastors is September the 28th. Then the general population cohort is September 3rd. And if somebody is struggling with addiction issues, our next one for recovery is August the 31st. To find out more, go to readinkrevival.com. But first, if this podcast is adding value to your leadership in life, I want to ask you to subscribe to the podcast, like it, and comment in the reviews at iTunes. Also, help us get the word out by sharing on your social media platforms. Thank you so much for doing that. Go to readingrevival.com and check out everything that we're up to. And while you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter that'll hit your inbox the first of each month with a powerful blog post, as well as all of our upcoming events. Events, you can go now and make that sign up. We want to go now into episode number 35 with Joyce Hill as we have a crash course in emotional intelligence and feedback. This is part one of a two part episode. Welcome, everybody, to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I am so excited today to have back Joyce Hill, our friend, colleague, and a member of our Life Point Church. She has had an amazing career. She has served as the organizational director in C-suites of Fortune 500 companies like Sprint, Telecommunications, State Street, H&R Block, and Chrysler Financial. Uh, She has trained executives in things like multi-tier feedback, uh, change management, cultural transformation, talent development, succession planning, team interventions, performance management, retention strategies, employee engagement, and personal development plans. And so she still has enough energy to spend some time with us today after (laughs) doing all of that. She, with 12 years, uh, has now served as an adjunct professor at universities, including Avila University, where she facilitates uh, numerous courses in the Masters of Science in Organizational Development. And she serves on the Board of Counselors there at Avila University. Joyce, welcome back to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. 
Oh, thanks for having me. It's so great to be back. And I love what we're going to talk about today. So I'm excited to share. <laughs> me too. Me too. Well, let's catch up with the context uh, again of you. You have not been on an episode since February the 27th. Oh my it gosh. Got, I know. It's been a day. A bit a minute, as the young people say. Yeah. And then tell us just a little bit about your backstory uh, and what got you into teaching university courses and then specifically you know, why did a course on emotional intelligence come to the surface? Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I never, if you would be talking to my 30-year-old self, I never would say, have said I'd be doing this today. Um, I think that I have, because of the people that have been in my life, the people that have been mentors, uh, my leaders, those that I've inspired to be, has led me to where I am today. And, and so some of the leadership roles, you mentioned some of the, the, the Fortune 500 companies where I've worked. Um, I had such great opportunities, not only to be able to lead and to do some fantastic projects in those companies, but also to develop myself. Because I got to tell you, there was a time that I would not have wanted to be my, a, a direct report of mine. Oh, you know, I, I was, I, I considered myself at one point to be a terrible leader, you know, yeah. and, and, and I, I pity those poor people that, you know, had me I, for a leader at that time. So I know me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and, and, and it's because of everything that I learned along the way and also realizing the importance of development, the importance of constantly growing, never being um, satisfied with where you are. And I mean that in a positive way. Yeah. You're always looking for how to do something better, how to be stronger, you know, at something, um, how to learn something new that you can bring into your toolbox. And I think it's because of that that led me to teaching. Uh, because I wanted to share that same inspiration and the same uh, opportunities that I had with leaders with these individuals who were getting their master's degrees in organizational development. And it's been, it's just been an absolute delight to work with these students. And while I've been teaching for 12 years, I still have students reaching out to me and for, with a question or if they're dealing with a career decision or because you build relationships with these individuals. Oh my God. Gosh, that is yeah. so awesome. Yeah. It is interesting that when you grow, you stay interesting. It's yeah. interesting that when you grow, <laughs> you stay interesting and mysterious. Yeah. The mystery of who you are uh, continues to uh, cause people to want to lean in. And I love how you have always grown. Ever since I've known you, you're still today uh, driving hard towards who, who, where, who can you uh who can you be, I guess would be a way to say it, or what can you grow in? What skills can you develop? And it's real inspiration to anybody who knows you. Uh, let's talk a minute about emotional intelligence in the sense of what, what is it? I mean, it's a buzzword. You'll hear it thrown around. If you do a Google search, you're yes. going to come across the, uh, the term. Uh, and some people call it EQ, I think. Uh, and so what, what is emotional intelligence? Yeah, emotional intelligence is really understanding how your emotions impact your thoughts, your decisions, your actions, you know, everything that you do. It, it's and because part of there's four major components to emotional intelligence. One of the components is self awareness. So you have to understand why you feel the way you do, why you're emoting the way you're emoting. What's causing me to be triggered this way? What's causing me to, to respond this way? So you have to have that emotional um, self-awareness about yourself. You know, and, and again, what triggers those emotions? Another component of emotional intelligence is self-management, mm -hmm. which is self-control. You know, um, I can tell you, I was such an impulsive individual years ago. If I thought something, I said something. You know, there was no theme, this, uh, filter. There was no screen for me. It just, if, it, if, it, if the thought came in my head, it came out of my mouth. Yeah. But I've learned over the years that you can't do that. Because, I mean, there's times when you want to be frank, but there's also times when you're trying to build or maintain a relationship that that's not going to be helpful. It's going to actually damage that relationship. So you have to learn self-control, which yeah. is the, the whole thing around self-management. A third component of into, um, emotional intelligence is social awareness. Mm -hmm. Now, social awareness has two key areas. One is empathy. 
And I know we're going to talk a little bit deeper, I think, into empathy yeah. as we go further in. But I, ha I have to, again, know my feelings and understand my feelings and what caused my feelings. Because the more I'm in touch with my feelings, the better I can observe those feelings or emotions in others. So if I don't have that self-awareness, how can I possibly be aware of what's going on with somebody else? I, I can't. Sense. It's impossible. And, and then organizational awareness. And organizational awareness has to do with what's going on around you and who, who are the players around you that you need to have in your network as a leader. You know, so who, because you need to get decisions made, you can't do the work all yourself, but you have to have that, that organizational awareness. And then the last component of emotional intelligence is relationship management. Mm, wow. And that's where we get into the development of people, um, inspiring people, you know, the, those that either report to us or those that are around us. And, you know, the, we have to keep in mind, too, that emotional intel intelligence isn't just for the leader in the workplace. Yeah. This is for your leadership role wherever you are. So it can be the family dynamic. It can be the workplace dynamic. It can be the church dynamic, the social dynamic. It doesn't matter where you are. Emotional intelligence has a place. Um, and so that relationship management is, you know, that, that inspiring of others, conflict management is a piece of that, um, building teams is a piece of that. So there's a lot of moving parts under emotional, that whole umbrella of emotional intelligence. Well, it sounds like there is a lot of psychology and neuroscience in emotional intelligence, and it now then has kind of been repackaged as this phrase, emotional intelligence, and then leveraged into the marketplace and different uh, organizations so that leadership can excel. Um, I do think that it's interesting how often I hear the word or the phrase emotional intelligence as it applies to helping people uh, get a better grip on who they are as a leader and how they can actually maximize uh, their, their abilities. Um, where does emotional intelligence, where does that phrase originate? Who began it? Who kind of made it popular? How did all this come to surface so that we can kind of go back to understanding why it became such a big thing and today why it is a big thing. Yeah, and actually emotional intelligence, even though it wasn't called that, has been studied ever since like about the mid 50s. And I'm talking 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> we got to put that one nine in front of that, right? Yeah, yeah, but it was never packaged that way. And then along comes an individual by the name of Daniel Goleman, mm. who has, you know, done a, a, an extensive amount of research, and he's well known. In fact, he's often given, if you will, the credit for coining the phrase emotional intelligence. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, he's written several books on it. And of course, now we, we see books from others. But I go back to his learnings and his books. Uh, because to me, you know, he's the one that I consider to be the master of emotional intelligence. And so he's the one that's really put it all together and realized its impact, if you will, in the, into the world of work. Because Often psychologists or psychiatrists are looking more, you know, those that study human behavior are looking more just in the, you know, family dynamic or social dynamic and not necessarily applying it to the workplace. I think what he has done brilliantly is be able to take those concepts and say, this is how it looks in organizations. This is how it looks as you are leading a group of people. And by improving, by strengthening, by developing these skills, you will become a much more effective leader. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think about uh, the research around hard skills, soft skills. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we think of hard skills, somebody who can execute on a technicality or a technical skill, somebody who is able to do administrative things, engineer some things. Um, and yet, when you look at the data, soft skills, which is related to these emotional intelligent domains, this soft skill uh, arena is really what causes people to succeed. Yes. Even, uh, even some of the smartest- Or fail. Or, or fail, yes. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. If you look at some of the smartest, highest IQ uh, with intelligence in terms of analytics and ability 
to separate and et cetera and apply. Those people uh, may have really shown up on paper to be brilliant, but then in real life scenarios, it's the people with soft skills or emotional intelligence that win the day. That's They're right. the ones who succeed and even move rapidly through an organization. Because really, when you think about leadership, leadership's influence, influence is not about a box on a flow chart. Uh, you can be someone way down a flow chart, but if you are leaning in to see people who are struggling with something and you lend your energy to them and you come beside them with emotional intelligence to make environments better, all of a sudden, that causes you then to be a leader. People perceive you as being a leader in that organization. That is such an important point because so many times, whether I am dealing with people in organizations that aren't in a leadership role, or I'm working with students and they're taking a course in leadership, yeah. or something, and we're talking about something around leadership, they'll often say, well, I don't think this really pertains to me because I don't ever plan on being a leader. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. let's talk about that because <laughs> we are all leaders. They don't, they, you know, what, and what they're doing is they're not seeing themselves in a management role. Oh, that's good. With good, direct good. reports. Yep. But we all have the ability to, we lead sometimes when we don't even realize that we're leading. Oh, yeah. And sometimes in organizations, we're leading in the wrong direction and yes. we don't call it leading. No, we don't. Because we're giving energy that compels to a direction opposite of the vision of the organization. That's right. And so that's division, division. Division, that's right. When we think about moving in the right or the vision direction, throwing energy on it, gathering people around us and so on, it's incredible. I know uh, my friend Steve Cuss, he's a pastor in Colorado, and he's written a book called Managing Leadership Anxiety. Great book. And he's been a guest on, on our podcast. And when I was talking with him, we were talking, he had worked in a, uh, an arena of hospitals where, uh, you know, people were dying um, and he had to manage or be a chaplain to the family members. Um, and so he learned a lot about anxiety. It caused him to drill in to see in the circuitry and find out what's happening. So now as a leader to leaders, he says this, it's an amazing idea. He says that anxiety will always hijack a group meeting because the attention will always go to the person with the highest anxiety. And the anxiety doesn't mean they're shaken. The anxiety right. simply means that they, before they can actually calm or experience what was just said or done, they hyper respond, they capture the control of the meeting, that anxiety is compelling. All of this goes back to soft skills or emotional intelligence. Well, but what you also described is something that we describe in emotional intelligence as the amygdala hijack. Come on, tell me about that. Okay, the, or, or you can even call it, if you don't want to say amygdala or have to figure out how to spell it, you can just simply call it the emotional hijack, which is really what's happening with that person feeling anxiety. Yes. And what goes on during that hijack is that as we are seeing something going on around us or hearing something that's going on around us, that information is coming through in, into our brain and it goes from, you know, that visual signal or the auditory signal goes to our thalamus in our, in our brain. I hope I said that right. Thal yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, so, you know, I, I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> so uh, the thalamus. And that's where it then is converted into what's known as brain language, if you will. And then from there, it's then moved on to the, um, I believe it's called the visual cortex. Is it the visual cortex? I believe that's right. Yes, visual cortex, where that's where it starts, we, the brain starts to analyze it. It starts to figure out what's the meaning behind what I'm seeing, what's the meaning behind what I'm hearing, so that the, we can then decide, the brain can determine what's the action that needs to be taken. Yeah. But here's what's interesting, is that there's actually been studies, and there was a neuroscientist in New York, Joseph Ledoux, Okay. Or Ladeau, it's French, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, who he actually uncovered that where you think that that entire message is going to that visual cortex where it's supposed to, there's a little bit of it that trails off and goes straight to the, the amygdala. 
So it kind of shortcuts and says, yeah, you go that way. I'm going over here. <laughs> and it's that, that message that goes to the amygdala. And without that self-control or the ability to react to those impulses, that's why we then respond the way we do. That's why we see the anxiety surfacing the way it surfaces when someone is feeling extreme anxiety because they're responding to that quick message that bypassed the visual cortex where all the reasoning and deciding and analyzing is going on straight to the, uh, the amygdala where the emotions are controlled. Yeah. And we're now responding very quickly. And yeah. that's why we call it the amygdala hijack, because often it's those responses that can do the most damage to the relationships that matter the most to us. And then decisions are not made in the best way. They're not even the best decisions for the organization. That's they right. are actually survival decisions. They're just that's right. for survival or a sense of a belonging. Panic uh, ends up taking over. And of course, we know that that goes through the entire body. Well, let's go back to, as we're defining emotional intelligence, uh, to these four domains. Can you just quickly tell us again the names of those four domains? Yeah, the first one is self-awareness. Okay. So, you know, having that, that um, emo but it's emotional self-awareness. It's not just self-awareness, me being, I'm here. It's the emotional self-awareness and, and having an accurate assessment around that. You know, we can have some emotional self-awareness, but is what we are believing about ourselves to be true? Is it accurate? So we need to have an accurate assessment of that. So um, self-awareness, self-management, self which is around self-control. Gotcha. And some, you know, adip, uh, uh, being able to be adaptable, so not being so rigid sometimes in your thoughts or the actions that you believe need to happen, but being able to kind of, you know, go with the flow kind of thing. Um, and then social awareness. That's where empathy comes in. And that's where the organizational awareness comes in. And the fourth one is relationship management. So what's the difference in the social and the relationship? The social awareness has to do with the, well, well, actually, there is a difference, but they all of these kind of build on each other. Yep. So, for example, you can't possibly be able to self-manage if you're not self-aware, you're not aware of what you need to manage, right? Yeah. And how can you possibly be empathetic to someone or have that organizational awareness if you are, you know, you have the inability to have some self-control or um, be adaptable to things. And the social awareness where you have developed a skill of empathy um, and also developed a skill of figuring out who are the power players, who are the people I need to have in my network, that's what you pick those people out, you choose those people, you surround yourself with those people, and then you start building those relationships. But you need to have those relationship skills that come under emotional intelligence, um, in order to build and maintain those relationships that you develop. You know, just because I reached out to someone to network to help them help me with something doesn't mean I've necessarily built a relationship. And they may decide, oh, my gosh, I never want to work with her again. Yeah. You know, but what I want to do is that if I find that that was valuable, what they were able to contribute and what we were able to do together, that relationship is important to me and I'm going to want to build it. So I need to have those relationship skills in my toolkit yeah. to be able to do that with that person. Are we typically blinded by uh, our lack of development around emotionally and um, emotional intelligence? How would we come to even figure out if, uh, if we are in need of an upgrade? That's, that, that, that's such a great question. And, you know, so much of that is what's the feedback that you get? But well, actually, let me back up. Do you get feedback? Do you seek it? <laughs> you know, because let's face it, some people don't seek feedback because they don't want to hear what people have to say. They get an amygdala hijack. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I'm not going to ask you how I'm doing or how well do I do this because I already know the answer and I don't want to hear it from you. Yeah. You know, so, um, but it's to seek the feedback. Um, and, and even just assess what do your relationships look like? You know, um, do you have, would you consider the relationships you have strong? And then really get honest and say, would you have a relationship with you? Mm. Would you want to have a relationship with you? Do you find yourself to be a nice person? And I don't mean that, you know, just kind of flippantly, but would you be someone that you would be attracted to, that you would want to develop a relationship, get to know, um, share ideas, you know, talk about things, uh, solve problems with, make decisions, those kinds of things. So how would you assess yourself? 
So that's one of the first things you can do. And that, if you will, if you notice, you're really actually stepping into that self-awareness piece. Yeah, yeah. When you're doing yeah. that. But yeah, I agree. I think the average bear out there is unaware of their level of or lack of emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. I know for me in transparency, um, feedback I can prep myself for and, uh, and think, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all ready for this. Uh, and then I start getting it. And in the moment that I'm getting it, um, I can have this nervous system level uh, kind of instinctive reaction that is the feelings of losing control. And then there's some panic that begins to happen. And um, I think about how I, you know, experience it in, in that moment. And then I have a deep desire to know in self-awareness what it is that I might be blinded by, how people are experiencing me. And it's interesting because that whole lack of control scenario I just went through, mm -hmm. that then gets placed over into, well, what if I don't know? Well, what if I'm not aware? What if, what if I am really blinded? Well, I don't know how people are experiencing me. And here's another component of that is I don't always trust that people are being honest oh. in their feedback. But that's because of my own wounds. Mm -hmm. And it's because yes. I've seen so many people who talk out of both sides of their mouths and about other people. And they will, to their face, tell them, they're, you're the greatest thing in the world. I mean, we all know what it's like for, you know, stereotypical Sue to tell Mary that is the most beautiful haircut I've ever seen in my life. And then Mary- Can you walked, believe that haircut she just got? There you go. Exactly. <laughs> what was she thinking when she dyed it pink? You know, whatever. Um, right. And right. so that then creates uh, a, and it, it comes from a wound profile, but this feeling of I'm dangling out there. I don't feel secure. I have a loss of control. So, you know, how do we move through that as executives? Yeah, well, first of all, you have to select your mentors mm. oh. or, or, or those people who give you that feedback with as much due diligence as you would select um, the love of your life. Come on. Okay, you've got to put some importance on it and not everybody should be the people necessarily that you're seeking feedback from. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I get it. You know, organizations and I've been one, I've, I've taken many what's, you know, our multi-rater uh, feedback um, tools and I've administer them and I get feedback from my direct reports and my boss and all that kind of stuff. And that's one thing, you know, but when it comes to the feedback that really hits to the heart of emotional intelligence, I think you have to be very selective initially with who you choose to give you that feedback. Yeah. You know, do you trust them? Do you believe that they are giving you the feedback that will be beneficial for you and they're doing it with all the intents and purposes of helping you to grow and to improve. You know, there's plenty of people out there that want to tell me, give me feedback and tell me how bad I am at doing things and they're not there to help me improve at all. Right. You know, right. they just want to tear me down. So, and, and that's all fine and well, um, but you really have to be selective in who you initially choose that, to get that feedback from because I think the more then you become comfortable yeah. and them receiving that feedback. Should you receive feedback from someone that you maybe don't have that type of relationship with, and you've also dealt with some of those wounds, let's face it, we have to also do that other work, which is dealing with the wounds, what's causing us to react the way we do when we hear feedback, um, certain kinds of feedback. But when you're doing those two things collectively, then when someone else is giving you feedback later down, you know, um, you know down the road, um, I don't think it's going to impact you as much. I don't think it's going to cause you the hairs on the back of your neck to stand up and say, well, wait a minute. I think I have to protect myself. I, you know, I, I think I have to, um, um, you know, put some armor around me because this is feeling uncomfortable for me. Um, and, or start judging yourself. You know, you should never judge yourself on the feedback you receive because if you judge yourself on the feedback you receive, chances are you're going to become angry. Yeah. And anger is going to cause frustration. Frustration is going to cause anxiety, and then you're probably going to say, forget it, I'm not going to work on it, and just keep yeah. moving in the same direction you've always been moving. 
Yeah. It's interesting because when you do feel that anxiety rising, you have this shame narrative. I'm not enough. I'm not valuable. I don't belong. Uh, survival is at risk here. Um, and so those different narratives that surface actually can, can shut us down. Um, and uh, there's this huge illusion that we all as humans live in of perfection and flawlessness. Sure. So when we have feedback that shows some of the fragility or shows cracks in our personalities, what we tend to do is we move towards that shame narrative yes. where if we could just say, wait a minute, it's normal to be imperfect. It's normal not to be good at everything. It's normal to have flaws. And because of that, if when I get feedback, I can lend my, uh, bend myself into loving myself or what you're talking about, having empathy, but now the empathy is to me. Right. The compassion is to me. The kindness is to me, which some of our harshest emotional criticisms come from us. Oh, no kidding. And, and what's crazy is in the brain, in the brain, the amygdala hijack is where you're getting cortisol releases, put you in fight, flight, freeze, and generally you become the target. What shame is, is cortisol targeting you as the problem. You're the problem of my loss of control. You're an idiot. You're stupid, et cetera. So when the anterior cingulate gyrus gets kicked in, which is empathy, gratitude, compassion, when it gets kicked in, it releases oxytocin that calms the cortisol, moves you into the nucleus accumbens, and you begin to experience the pleasure centers of the brain, or you experience contentment, fulfillment, and so on. I think it's interesting because the first person that you need it, from a Christian worldview to have empathy to you in your imperfection is God. Absolutely. God, number one, he sees you in your humanity and he loves you, delights in you and admires the wonderfully and fearfully made person that he's created. And the, no matter what the facade is that we try to put up, he sees through it. Oh, he, yes. There yeah, are no there, secrets. There is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You can't, you can't, we hide, can't hide anything. No, no, not at all. Yeah. And the gift of righteousness that we are given as Christians is actually the empowerment from God for us to now not only receive his delights in us and to say, no matter what I emote or feel or what I am experiencing uh, biologically and neurobiologically in this moment, I know he loves me, likes me, he's in a good mood. And then you can begin to leverage that righteousness to love yourself. So the first person that you need to have empathy and compassion from is God. The second is you. Yes. And by doing that, you can regulate down all those sphere circuits and finally be able to receive feedback and say, yeah, you know, I am weak in that area, but that doesn't define me. Right. And, you know, I've got you back, man. I'm for you. You're talking to yourself, helping yourself realize that in my imperfections, I'm a good guy. I have the grace of God to make up my weaknesses. So where I'm weak, he's strong. And so it, it's not now something that's based in my survival because my survival is in God. So again, all of a sudden we begin to regulate around the whole idea of empathy that you're talking about rather than that shame narrative of idiot, stupid. I can't believe right. that I'm not doing this better. Well, and I can't think of, you know, it, if you really back up and want to know the origins of emotional intelligence, just walk the walk of Jesus. Oh, come on. He was probably the greatest example of exhibiting emotional intelligence of any person that walked this earth that I can think of. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Self-awareness. He knew exactly who he was. Yeah. You know, he, he had that emotional self-awareness. And he was not afraid to cry. He was not afraid to show his emotions. But that self-awareness that he had about him also gave him that emotional awareness of others around him. He was also able to self-manage. He had that self-control. I mean, let's look what happened, you know, is they arrested him. I mean, he could have done a lot of different things, but he didn't. He maintained control. He said, there's no need. There is no need for me to tell them certain things, to do certain things, because first of all, I also, you know, he knew what was, what needed to happen, but then he had that social awareness. Look at the network he built. 
Yeah. His yeah. disciples, a great network that he, he built because he knew he couldn't do all the work himself. Yeah. And he knew that he, that he would only be on this earth for so long. So he had to pass on his knowledge and, and instruction to others so that they could go forth and, and continue that message. So talk about in relationship management. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you really want to give the origins of emotional intelligence, we can yeah. go all the way back to <laughs> Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And God, the father who created us. That's right. With That's emotions. right. That's right. I think that's amazing. You know, talking about having a mentor that'll give you feedback, one of the ways you can do this is if you have a therapist who, uh, not all therapists are wired to kind of hit you between the eyes, um, but then there are some that do. One of the therapists that I have been trained with and uh, also worked out some of the kinks in my own story um, he is a guy that he heard themes. I was with him for multiple days, uh, multiple hours each day as he's training me and digging into me and helping me see who I am. And, um, as we're going through it, I'm telling him he's asking and I'm giving stories. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that happens is when I get around certain people that inspire me, I like to dig, I like to interview, I like to go deep. I wanna, I wanna see distinctions. I, I wanna get clarity around some things and surface conversation doesn't always, it's not easy for me overall. I mean, I can talk football, baseball for a while, all that's good, but then I really, my heart's always interested in who are you, what's going on, where are you coming from? And I was with one of my heroes, by the way. I'm telling this story to my therapist. I was with one of my heroes uh, some months earlier, and somebody who's written books and just an amazing uh, psychologist and, and uh, tenured leader. And I'm, I'm spending time with this guy. We're in a group with some pastors, and he begins to uh, tell uh, some stories of some things, and because of the therapeutic background with my addiction certification mm -hmm. as a professional, um, I knew that there is uh, an area here that's very nuanced that's helpful to leaders to pull up. So I brought it out. Uh, and I did it in a way where I genuinely wanted to hear what his distinction, how he would slice and dice it. Well, when I did, he threw his head back, rolled his eyes with... That is so ridiculous. Um, and he didn't even know it. It was, it was an amygdala hijack for him. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, he had been, you know, drinking a, a bit of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had lost some of his, uh, his limitations. And so he ends up just kind of, and then he gathers himself after he had kind of ranted for a minute. And yet I was right. I was right in what I said. And so in that example, in fact, uh, a few days later, the guy had pot taken pot shots at me a few times, this, this hero of mine. And, uh, and so my, a friend of mine asked me, he said, hey, did you notice so-and-so whenever you said, did you think that that was odd how he came after you? And I, and I didn't say anything until he brought it up. And I said, uh, actually, yeah, wasn't that wasn't that bizarre? He's like, oh my gosh, what was that all about? So, I mean, it was, it was obvious. So I tell this to the therapist. Mm -hmm. And when I do, he, the therapist says to me, says, well, Patrick, you are a disruptor. That's what you do. And he said, uh, in its glory, it is the image of God in you. That it is something that God's gifted you with to be able to enter into tradition things that everybody is structured and they have no wiggle room around and yet it is keeping them in a, you know, boxed, uh, stuck place. And he said, what you do is your gift when it's in its glory is you come into that space and you say, have you ever thought about it another way? <laughs> and he said, now here's the deal in your wound profile from childhood up, you think that you can do that without having snipe shots shot at you. Hmm. And, uh, and he said, when you get, you know, the snipers shooting bullets, then you get hurt and you try to figure out what you did to hurt everybody, what you did to deserve that. And so 
it is interesting that if you can get some people in your life, so for me, who doesn't always trust all the feedback that I would ever get, mm-hmm. I'm sitting there listening to him and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I can trust this. I need to explore that and find out more about what makes me tick there, why I do what I do there. So I'm just putting a, a, a big highlight um, on the idea of learning what your emotional intelligence really is by getting somebody who isn't necessarily a stockholder in your life mm-hmm. where they can tell you the truth, but they don't lose anything by doing it. Right. And that's why I often have suggested, because I, I actually did my, my master's thesis on mentoring. Oh my gosh. And one of the things that I've always encouraged people to do and that I've done myself too, when I seek out mentors is seek out a mentor that you do not have that state, that person doesn't have that stake in you in terms of um, they're not the ones that are uh, assessing your job performance. They're not the ones that will determine what your next pay raise will look like. So absolutely bosses, bosses can, you know, they can mentor us from time to time, but they should not be that go-to mentor for certain things because the other reason is that you may not want to show your vulnerabilities to your boss. Yeah, yeah. As comfortable, if you will, to someone who you're going to them for a specific reason. I, I'm seeking you out to mentor me on X because I want to learn X and I see you're really good at X and I want you to mentor me through that. And I want to seek your feedback on this. I want you to help me to get really good at doing this. And so having those people outside, if you will, of what would be your normal um, Uh, area of contact, you know, your own personal network, but even reaching out um, outside of that network is huge, huge, and a really good idea because you will get that solid feedback. They don't, they, they will give it to you straight. Um, And, but they will also, in most cases, because of who you sought out, will give it to you with a level of emotional intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Because they know you want to get better. And so they're going to deliver it in, to you in that way that says, I know you want to grow. Here's what I've observed. Here's what I see you doing. And here's what you might want to do in order to get better. Yeah. And in reality, feedback uh, fundamentally is an act of love. Yes, it is. If somebody's giving you feedback, they love you enough to share it because it takes energy and it takes nuance and it takes complexity to weigh in and know that this potentially is going to hurt somebody's feelings. I know because it actually sometimes takes guts too. lots of guts, lots (laughs) of guts. Uh, there again, a lot of courage. So, uh, but when as a leader that you are needing to give feedback to somebody who is a part of your organization, if you don't give the feedback, they don't always quantifiably have verbiage around it. They don't consciously know how to make sense of it. But internally, they know there's something about this leadership relationship where I'm not being loved or valued. There's something about good, emotionally intelligent feedback that makes the person who's getting it actually feel cared for feel valued. You're valuable enough to me that I'm going to believe in your future to help you grow. That's, so, I love that. Do you have more thoughts on feedback around that? Well, you know, the thing around, around the feedback is that when we are seeking feedback from others, we actually are raising them up and letting them know that we value them. Mm. So just asking them, about how they see me doing something. How do they see me handle that situation? Um, Or how would they, if they were in that same situation, how would they have done, would they have done it differently? And if so, what would they do? When you seek that feedback, you are actually showing them that you value them because you are going to them for that information. And then the key that's here too is that you have to listen to what they have to say. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It doesn't mean you even have to act on it, but you have to listen to what they have to say because listening also is a way in which to show value to the person who's speaking. Yeah. Is truly listening to what they have to say. That is so good because uh, again, it's all in this emotional intelligence umbrella, this, this idea of, of getting feedback. And I know as a leader, it's not common that, I get people inviting me to give them feedback. 
uh, around emotions. Yeah. And today, you know, I, I have two adult sons and hard skills, they develop in mentorship from YouTube. <laughs> they, they went to YouTube to learn how, and the truth is YouTube can do it a lot better than me because you have video, visual, yeah. or hard skill stuff, and it's very concise. They could do it in 10 minutes, and my boys would hear me, and they'd be like, Dad, two hours into it, I, it'd just been easier if I had to watch YouTube. <laughs> and I get that. Of course, that's an exaggeration, but that is uh, the, the essence. But, well, but that's also a differentiator, though, between a hard skill and a soft skill. That's why, it, but a lot of people I don't think realize is that a hard skill, I can learn a hard skill by reading something, by viewing something, by somebody telling me something, and then I can go do it. That's a hard skill. Yep. A soft skill, I can still read about it. I can see people doing it, but then I have to put it in practice. Yeah. I'm not going to develop that skill until I actually start using it, start applying it, and getting feedback on it. That's what really differentiates those two skills. Yes, yes. And what you're saying is, is that soft skills are only refined or developed in the context of relationships. That's right. They, they have to have that. It's kind of like I can read about uh, building a six-pack on, on my abs, but if I don't go to the gym – and apply what I've read or watched on YouTube. I that six-pack is not going to appear. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. You know, again, we have, uh, we have this idea, this important priority to grow in emotional intelligence. And uh, just sticking on this idea of feedback for a minute, because this is where it all starts, is that a person can invite others in and yes. say, you know, how do you experience me in these environments? What is your reflection? Give me an idea and dig into it. Now, what people will do, and it's so interesting because sometimes people have a low level emotional intelligence themselves mm -hmm. and they, the way that they uh, armor up or the way they protect themselves when you ask them that question is they want to fix you. And yes. the way they want to fix you is to hyper encourage you or premature encourage you. Premature encouragement is where you hear somebody say, hey, um, I'm inviting you in. What would be some feedback you could give? And they're like, oh, because they think you're depressed. They think you're filled with anxiety. You're in, filled with self-doubt, et cetera. And so then they come in and they're like, oh, no, you're doing a great job. And it's like, that's not what I'm asking. Right, right. I'm not asking for you to be my encourager right now. I mean, great if you, you know, feel like I'm doing good at something. I just need candor. I need something that has no fluff in it. Um, when you think about this uh, idea of feedback and uh, the need to hyper or premature encourage, you know, do you have some thoughts around that that would help us? Well, it's how we give feedback. You see, what you were just sharing in terms of that encouragement piece is really not feedback. That's awesome. Feedback comes when there's specificity attached to it. Because if I don't know specifically what I did or what I said, how do I even know what I did well or what I did poorly and I need to change on? If you just say, oh, you're doing a great job, well, thanks. A great job on what? A great job on living? <laughs> That's so good. You know, a great job on leading. But, but if, I, if, if I'm going to give feedback to someone, let's say that they're, they happen to be a poor listener, and so I want to give them some feedback on their poor listening skills, I need to give them some specificity around that and say, you know, in our last meeting, uh, and, and again, this, it's also important to use a lot of I statements here, be, and I know that sounds old school, but it's still prevalent today. I statements mean you're giving them your perception and you're not trying to be judgmental. This is what I perceived. This is how this made me feel. And so in our last meeting, I felt as though you weren't listening to me because I noticed that when the phone rang, you'd look over to see what the, the number was, or when you heard the ding on your computer, you would look over to that, you know, to your computer to see what the email was coming through. And I just didn't feel as though you truly heard what I was saying. And I want to talk about that. You know, how can we do that differently? What can we do that's different so that I feel that I am listened to when we the next time we talk. See, I've given you some specificity around a behavior. Yes. Instead of just saying, you know, the last time we met, you didn't listen to me worth a darn. 
thanks. Right, right. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. And I love that you start with the eyes. In fact, throughout it, it's the eyes. Because what you're doing is you're sharing your experience without casting judgmental uh, data to them. You're not judging them or attacking them. You're just saying, this is how I experienced you. And That's right. And it's like you're offering them a gift at that point. Yeah, because if I were to say, you know, in our last meeting, you know, all you did was pay attention to your telephone, pay attention to, you know, your email. That's all you did through the entire meeting. It was, you know, everything was all about what was happening around you. Oh, thanks. That's really helpful feedback. <laughs> right, right. I know on the positive side, uh, I'm a, you know, five love languages, words of affirmation guy. Well, somebody tell me that was a great message. It means nothing. I, honestly, mm -hmm. there is no emotional bond to that at all. But if you tell me, first of all, that there's specific statements that I made in my teaching or preaching or leadership uh, flow of things, if, if you specify it and then talk about why it was impactful, yes, um, how you want to apply it or even weeks later, come back and say, you know, five weeks ago when you said or when you taught, that totally changed my life, and here's how it has changed my life. My words of affirmation personality just blows up with satisfaction. But yes. again, just telling me I, I did a good job uh, doesn't, doesn't do much. And I know even in my marriage with Tina, uh, she and I over the years have had conversation. I'm a words of affirmation guy. But I have a tendency to just tell her she's beautiful because she is. She's, she's, just, she's gorgeous. And I'll tell her that she's beautiful. Well, what really lands for her if I identify specific things that are maybe glowing or emphasized in my heart or perception about her. And when I do that and I'm able to do it where it's not robotic, it's not like Siri talking, on, on your right. <laughs> you but, are beautiful because of your haircut today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's like, wow, girl, man, I love what you did with whatever. Right. Right. Um, but so now here's, here's something that's important though, too, because see, you and I are having this conversation. People are listening to this podcast and they're going, okay, well, I can do that. I can be sure that I give some specificity around feedback and whatever. But now here's what happens. They go to seek feedback from somebody and that feedback is, oh man, you did a great job. That was awesome. Great job. Keep doing what you're doing. And they're like, oh, well, that really worked out well. Okay. <laughs> well, what we need to do then is we need to help to coach that person giving us feedback on how to give feedback. How would you do that? I would do that by saying, okay, well, thank you for that. I appreciate you letting me know that, you know, you really liked what I did, but can you tell me specifically what it was that you liked? Yeah. What did I say or what did I do? What was it? Can you tell me anything specific? And some might be able to do that and others will go, uh. Well, what they'll do is they'll be like, shoot, man, I, I thought I could just throw a pass out there and then go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what we want to do, though, to not damage the relationship. Yes. Because, you know, they're going to feel foot on the spot and they're going to go, well, gosh, I just can't think of anything right off the top of my head. No, that's okay. That's okay. But you know what I would love is when you, uh, when we're together in a meeting or there were whatever it was that, that happened, um, would you kind of, you know, just kind of pay, uh, you know, maybe jot down something, you know, a couple of things that you heard me say or saw me do that you thought was really good or maybe something I could do differently so that you can remember. So the next time I ask you, you, you could share that with me. That would be so awesome if you could do that. Could you do that for me? <laughs> yes, Joyce, I yeah. could do that for you. Yeah, see, that's what we do. And that's where we're coaching them to give us feedback. And they don't even realize that's what we've done. Yeah. Oh, see, I love that. And I think it's such a powerful thing to seek that out, which is where a lot of this conversation got catalyzed. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that all of us should be seeking feedback so that we can uh, know where our blind spots are yeah. and, uh, and be able to grow. And because we all have dreams, we all have desires, we all yeah. have a sense of purpose. And yeah. It's, yeah. it's the sense of being stuck and I can't do anything, you know, kind of learned helplessness that uh, I've done everything I know to do to grow me, grow my organization, guide my family, lead my marriage or impact and influence 
uh, the different relationships I have. I've done everything I know to do mm -hmm. and I'm not getting the metrics. I'm not getting the results. And so when you get stuck, what you've done is you've in essence abdicated that, you know, I, it's impossible for me to grow and you have uh, really an amygdala hijacking, which is the idea of fight, flight, freeze, you're frozen. That's and, right. Uh, and so you got to have some people to help you uh, get out of your, you know, to thaw you out and get, yeah. you to, get you moving again. Well, and one of the things that a lot of leaders have seen, I'm sure, if, you know, if they've read any books or they've taken a leadership course, somewhere along the way, they probably have been, been introduced to something that's known as the Jahari window. And the Jahari window is just really, it's a window with four panes in it. And in each pane, it represents a part of us, a side of us. One is the open side of us. So one quadrant is the public or the open side of us. So I know this about me and everybody around me knows this about me. So that's the, the public side. And then there is the, um, the um, private side. And that side is the, the side where I know this about me, but I don't necessarily share this with others. Others don't know this about me. And then there's the um, more of, it's kind of like the blind side, if you will, where mm -hmm. others know this about me, but I don't know this about me. And then there's the hidden side where it just hasn't even been, I haven't even discovered it yet. So I don't even know this about me. No one knows. It's just a piece of that window. And when we normally see that Johari window, we see the quadrants in equal, in, of equal value, of equal size. But the whole secret behind the Johari window is not that those panes remain equal, but that you continue to enlarge that public or the the um, the uh, the and, and the other three the, the hidden and the and the private you begin to expand those so that you become freer to share more about you you're more comfortable in sharing a, you know wow. more of your intimate side and you seek that feedback from others so that it becomes more public but that's the piece often so when I teach the Johari window that people don't necessarily see is that you work to expand that public or the the known if you will yeah. um, window pane and you do that by seeking feedback by getting feedback from others that's and so, acting on it that's so good well i i love the expertise that you are bringing and offering in this uh, space around feedback so to kind of wrap up this first segment we have uh the four domains of emotional intelligence um we uh, kind of created a beginning point of, uh, of self-awareness with feedback that, you know, how do we even know we need to grow in emotional intelligence? Uh, before we conclude this, this part, um, is there another beginning point or would you say uh, becoming a person who is seeking to grow in emotional intelligence is where it all begins? Uh, kind of where, where do we start? Well, first, let this be your catalyst. So let this be something that inspires you to want to seek that emotional intelligence level out in you. So that would be number one. Um, and then focus on like those first two components of emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness and self-management. The other things will come. In fact, some of the other pieces, the social awareness and the, and the relationship management, almost sometimes happen by default just because of the work that you've done in self-awareness and self-management. But focus on those first two components, which basically says, focus on you first. Yeah. You can't do anything about those around you until you do something about you. Yeah. It has to be intrapersonal, and that's the self-awareness, that's the self-management. And you do that by seeking some of that feedback that we talked about, you know, but go to those trusted individuals. Don't just seek out, you know, you know don't be you know, walking down the halls of your workplace or whatever and just stopping people in the hallway saying, so can you give me some feedback today? No, that's not what I'm saying. But seek the feedback from the trusted individuals. So that would be, would be mine. So the two things, one, determine yourself. Do you want, let this be your catalyst, do you want to seek out more information about emotional intelligence as it relates to you? And if so, then let's focus on the self-awareness and the self-management piece. I love it. And it does occur to me that many people will think of these first two pieces that if I, if I really need to grow in emotional intelligence or if I seek feedback, it will expose my weaknesses. And then they, I know even where people in their marriages needing therapy, uh, and when I say need therapy, if Tiger Woods needs a coach to help him golf, 
every human needs a coach to help them be a human. Yeah. And that means in marriage and business and in every uh, venue of life. So um, I think, again, this cycles us back around to some of what we talked earlier about recognizing that weakness is human and that uh, you have weakness whether you're admitting it or not. Right. And so if you're covering it up in the name of uh, arrogance, which incidentally people may not know uh, overall that narcissism, clinical narcissism, is actually born from trauma. That a person who's been traumatized or they experienced significant griefs and losses rela uh, relationally and had injuries emotionally in their life. So rather than lean into community to regulate and to become whole, they decide to armor up and control and power over everybody. That's right. And, and so if you don't wanna be a narcissist, in terms of how you lead, which narcissism will always leave tons of collateral damage. And if you want to be a healthy, whole person, you're gonna to have to first of all recognize that you are weak, you are a human, you need to have uh, a podcast like this to compel you or what you're using the word catalyze, catalyze you to move forward in your life and then finally, get a mentor or a group of people to give you the kind of feedback that's honest and specific. And uh, Joyce, this has just been so awesome. And I can't wait till uh, our next time together because we're gonna pick up on part two where we're gonna dig further into emotional intelligence. But this will be, uh, be the conclusion of, uh, of this first part. It was, it was brilliant, it was so awesome. Joyce, thanks for, uh, for giving time to us today. Well, wow, thank you for giving me a soapbox today. I so enjoy sharing this information because trust me, I learned this myself and I, I, I am so fortunate that I had the opportunity to be exposed to this and to, to um, if you will, kind of polish down the rough edges. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. I still have plenty of rough edges I have to polish down, but it's, it's been a great journey and I love to share this with others so that they too can experience the journey. Love it. Thank you for joining us today for part two of a crash course in emotional intelligence and feedback with Joyce Hill. Be sure to subscribe and download the upcoming September 24th episode number 39. You'll really, really be glad you did. You might be wondering, well, what's next? Consider attending one of our webinars, personal discovery experiences, masterclass experiences, or retreats. Also subscribe to this podcast at any podcast provider and YouTube. Go to ReadingRevival.com to find out all the unique opportunities to grow your life and leadership. And then while you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter that'll hit your inbox the first of each month with a powerful blog post. Everything we're building is to reinforce and resource you with a whole heart as a leader. I'd love for you to be a part of our tribe. I can't wait till our next episode. I'm glad that you're with us today. We'll see you next time.